large British engineering firm, perhaps for those less familiar with us, but if you know Dubai, uh, we designed the Burj Al Arab and we did design the longest autonomous vehicle in existence at the moment, that being the Dubai Metro. Um, clearly, um, trains run themselves, but the stations and the viaduct were designed by uh, our company. Welcome all. Um, I'm not aware today of any um, fire uh, drills or whatever, however, um, you'll be aware obviously of the exit to the, to the rear um, and uh, elsewhere, and we may be aware should such uh, an occurrence happen. Um, we made the papers today. We're in the front of the uh, free newspaper um, that many residents get um, around uh, Dubai. Uh, look, no hands. So I know, um, unfortunately, I was not here uh, yesterday, but I'm aware that a German manufacturer, a car company, um, did run a vehicle between Dubai and Abu Dhabi um, last week and uh, showed um, the, the great promise um, that uh, autonomous vehicles have uh, moving forward. I would also mention um, that I'm an Atkins Fellow. Um, this means that we um, seek to heighten um, the technical excellence and innovation within our company. And two weeks ago, we all met in London um, to talk about autonomous vehicles and connected vehicles, drawing all our colleagues from around the world, in North America, Asia, um, Europe, um, Middle East and elsewhere. And to talk about the challenges that we feel we have as a company, and of course we had a number of clients that spoke to us, and we had some very interesting discussions um, about that. And I hope today that we will have further uh, understanding, particularly around the challenges um, that face this new um, age that we're in. It's also worth saying that um, a conference uh, my colleagues were at two weeks ago, a child of 12 said, well, if they're that safe, why aren't we using them already? So it does show that there's a key appetite in youngsters to understand what the transport will be uh, moving forward uh, in the future. So today's um, conference, we're going to hear uh, more from um, manufacturers about what they're doing in the autonomous vehicle space. We'll hear about the UK's uh, programme in CAV um, um, thinking. We'll have debates around issues and challenges facing autonomous vehicles and later we'll talk about the role of the telecoms and indeed the technology revolution that's happening within the taxi industry. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker this morning, uh, Dr. Kiss from Audi. Um, I would say right up from the start, um, a number of you um, today, um, I may find difficulty pronouncing your names, are quite um, interesting, um, I'll do my best. Um, Dr. Kiss clearly was not that difficult. Um, but thank you all for coming today and I uh, look forward to um, lots of discussion. Um, Dr. Kish, as you'll see, there's a big 30 um, at the base of your, um, so you should keep to their time of about 30 minutes. Thank you very much. I'll try my very best. Good morning and thank you for all being able to introduce you to the all new way of approaching piloted driving. And uh, for the big trends, I think we're pretty much in line with the rest of the presentations. So with the automated driving, uh, we address enhanced safety because our vehicles won't fall asleep, um, our vehicles won't be aggressive, and they will do a pretty good job. Um, we will be much more eco-friendly because um, we see all the speed limits in advance, we see all the topology in advance, and if we move further and more vehicles go in automated mode, we also uh, get the efficiency platooning effects, um, so everything will be much better. Um, the most relevant thing is the comfort, because you can use your time for what you like to do in dense traffic on highways and we give you back the 25th hour of the day, so your commute will be your private time, again. Um, last but not least, it's the efficient use of um, the infrastructure. So if all vehicles will be automated, we can pack them closer together and use the roads we have in a much more efficient way. Um, today we have a vast number of assistance systems packed in our cars. So at the moment, the Q7 and the A4, A5, 
uh, is packed with a whole level of uh, level two systems. Um, so state of the art driver system, the last step before we start into major automatization. Um, so there will be this gray line that separates the assisted world from the world of piloted driving, as we say. And as we heard from Kia yesterday, um, it won't be the end of driver assisted systems because any sensor that adds to the car adds more safety systems and more assistance systems we can directly offer to our customers. But automation is quite near. In the next A8 that will appear next year, you see the traffic jam pilot to the, the first level 3 system on the market. So today, no OEM has more than a level 2 system. We hope it will be the first with a level 3 system in the next year. Then the park pilot, so remote parking, will be offered as well. Not much time will go till we have the motorway pilot. So one step further from traffic jump that will function to 60 km per hour, the motorway pilot will function to 130 km per hour and will give you completely relaxed travel on the motorway or highway. Last but not least, the city pilot. Um, and we're pretty much in line with the uh, time scales we heard yesterday. So the city is a very complex era. If we move on with our serious cars and the traditional development, we see that at about 2030. Um, there may be some disruptive vehicles coming to the cities earlier, but it won't be the classic passenger car as we know it today. So what have we done till now? A little movie will give you an introduction. Can you please start the movie? Yeah, thanks. Audi is a pioneer of piloted driving, a success story at seven milestones. In 2009, Audi is the first car maker to test piloted driving in the desert. A TTS drives over the Bonneville Soft Flats in Utah, USA, and sets a world record for self-driving vehicles with a speed of approximately 210 kilometers per hour. 2010, Pikes Peak, an extremely challenging hill climb in the U.S. An Audi TTS without driver races 12 miles and 156 turns via differential GPS with a precision of only a few centimeters. The 2013 CES in Las Vegas, Audi receives the license for driverless driving in Nevada. Audi delivers an impressive demonstration of everyday practicality and real-world tests of driving in a traffic jam and parking. Audi exhibits the next generation of piloted driving at the 2014 CES. The driver assistance module ZFAS is now only the size of a laptop and another milestone on the road to production readiness. In August and September 2014, Florida and California give their approval for piloted driving testing. Audi conducts exhaustive tests on the highways. October 2014, an Audi RS7 is to complete a lap around the Grand Prix circuit at the Hockenheim Ring without a driver. A top performance at the limit, which on the high-speed circuit requires the utmost precision to succeed. The green flag is waved. Bobby is absolutely away. The first piloted car here at the Hockenheim Ring with Audi. This RS7 accelerates as the tens of thousands of fans here witness history in the making from Audi piloted driving. The absolute optimum lap as the car comes to a stop now. That was truly awesome. January 2015, an Audi A7 Sportback piloted driving concept drives from San Francisco to Las Vegas. A true long distance test as long as 560 miles. The A7 brakes, accelerates, changes lanes and passes other cars on the highway without a driver being involved. Journalists were impressed of the reliability of piloted driving at Audi. So this is a short overview of things we have done and uh, racing the automated cars has one simple reason. 
So we have heard since the late 90s we're able to drive on the motorways, we're able to keep lanes and uh, from a research point of view it seemed to be ready. But on the other hand, uh, we might get on some slippery road all of a sudden, uh, we might handle difficult situations. And uh, these cars, whether they were driving on the gravel or on the racetrack, are finger training for us to make pilot driving a safe mode of driving. It's very important. Um, well, you've seen levels yesterday. Uh, first time I want to point out that at the moment, uh, no OEM offers more than a level 2 system. And for us, it's a very important differentiation between uh, the systems and pilot driving uh, is uh, a step from level 2 to level 3. Because with level 3, we as a vehicle manufacturer take over response for the driving task. And before level 2, all the response lies with the driver. This is a major change for us in responsibility and in the way of making our automated systems. So, um, this is the magic border uh, we have to talk about later on. And um, these systems will add a huge amount of comfort to the driving. What will happen while you drive? Um, former days, you had your car and the driver was packed with tasks like accelerate, brake, steer, change gears, turn signal, even changing the ignition point. Um, and very little was given to a secondary task in playing around with your wens, with your climate control, with your entertainment system. Um, by now, we have much more to do with configuring the car and our assistance uh, sets the driving task much easier than it has been before. And there's more time for us to spend with navigation, media, <coughs> etc. So, nowadays this is distraction. This is a bad thing to do for us um, because traffic is the important point we should concentrate on and therefore with level 3 automation we have more time for this secondary task entertainment, it will turn into a primary task, it will keep us awake and this will be our comfort in driving and it will be a safe mode to do that. Well, there's a lot of regulatory stuff concerning level 2 systems at the moment. A um, lot of processes to be held and all have the control of the driver in focus. So even the next step we have to do, the driver won't be in control of the vehicle because he might fall asleep while driving or while being driven. And that's good. Uh, from a technical side, this means that with assisted driving, we have a classical vehicle like we had before. And as we heard yesterday, we need to have redundancy with the piloted vehicles. So first of all, um, we need a technical fallback level on the sensor level, so we uh, need to make sure that a single sensor problem uh, doesn't cause any problem in driving at all. Um, we need a, a fallback level in the computational level, and of course in the braking and steering system overall. So for the first automated task on the highway, um, we are ready, we're set up. For the more complicated things like rural roads and faster traffic in the city, uh, this hasn't happened yet. We're on the way. Um, for the interface, this might have major changes as well. So this is our actual prototype interface for pilot driving. Uh, you see an LED stripe uh, beyond the windscreen. Uh, this is a peripheral stripe just uh, with the sense that you can see it wherever you look in the car. It's very prominent. So the color and the movement gives you an indication whether the car is in piloted mode or not. Uh, we have a little smart display right beyond the infotainment screen. And the reason is when you're watching a movie on this screen, you won't see anything that happens in the copy cluster. So this tiny screen gives you an information of how long your automatic travel will be 
And what's the next maneuver that the vehicle is actually planning? Um, so it changes also in the interior if we keep the classical vehicle. If we do urban pot someday, it will be much more. What are the topics for us that are most interesting and uh, where our work goes to? So, the most, most interesting topic at the moment is smooth traveling in dense traffic. So it is smooth accelerating and braking, it is the intelligent lane change. Not every lane change you can imagine does make sense. Uh, in pilot mode, um, our drivers want to have comfort. So they don't want to have their car putting out the lane, pulling back without taking over. So the car has to make up his mind, does it make sense to take over or uh, do I accept the three kilometers per hour um, uh, that uh, the car in front of me goes slower and just follow him. Um, the passengers in those cars don't care much about speed. They just care for comfort. So they don't rec even recognize five kilometers is faster or slower because they're in their film, in their book, or wherever. Um, maintaining distances on the lateral side. That's very important because it's easy to go always in the middle of the lane. It's not that easy to um, keep the comfortable distance to the truck on the right side as well as to the fast cars on the left side. And uh, we have to balance that so that the driver is comfortable with the vehicle. That's a very interesting task. Um, recognizing the intentions of other road users. This is very important for comfortable ride because um, we don't want to have emergency brakings or um, um, fast lane maneuvers um, all of a sudden. We want to think about what are the others going to do and how we can we filter in this traffic and do a comfortable move. Uh, we will allow merging because the defensive way of automatic movement is the only way that makes traffic efficient. So this is new for one or the other driver that uh, we really can step back, let others merge and see that the traffic is moving smoothly. The next thing that is new is for our navigation systems. So what we learned is um, we classify the roads and see on which kind of road is piloted driving possible. And nowadays with the navigation system we have the fastest track, we have the shortest track and in the future we will have also uh, the route with a maximum piloted mode. So this is a new information for our customers, this is a very important one because people tend to um, take the longer route if there's a longer pilot mode included because they can use the time and this is really common. Coming again to the levels and step one level up, not far away we have level <coughs> four pilot systems. Level four means uh, there's no driver needed in some circumstances, so with a limited um, limited um, functional use, maybe the parking garage, uh, we can use the car without a driver, have a complete level 4 system. This might look like this. So this is my office and this is the comfortable way of parking in the future. So my colleague will leave the car in this handover zone that is marked on the floor. We we'll just send the car away using his smartphone. And after a couple of seconds, because it is possible that you forget to take something from the car car will disappear in the parking garage and you can leave for home, for office, for whatever and save relevant time. So this is a tiny smart parking garage um, here in the Sykes-Ayet Road behind uh, the skyscrapers. I've seen much bigger garages so maybe you save a couple of ten minutes uh, in getting to the office. How does this function? 
Um, so if this is a parking garage, um, we have uh, a handover zone, so the car is driven manually in this handover zone, and then we have a pilot zone where the car has all the maps and is able to go on his own, finding a parking lot and being responsible for itself. What's the major change in that? The major change is for the pilot driving on a highway, we didn't need any data connection to anywhere. So we're pretty um, sure that we can see the world with our sensors. We can take all the, uh, all the response uh, from the vehicle side. Um, coming to a parking garage, we have to get contact to the world. This looks complicated for the first glance. For the customer, sorry. Uh, for the customer, it's quite easy. So the customer has a car and a customer request. And all the rest is on a technical basis. So we use the metaphor of the uh, airport tower. So the parking garage will have the function of the airport tower. It will tell which parking lot to use. It will take where the car should go and it will negotiate the roads. All the maneuvering is done by the car itself. So we will always have the response for the driving task we will do. Um, but the parking garage might negotiate our way around. So these parking garages are ready for mixed use. So manual cars as well as automatic cars can uh, live together in these parking garages. And this will save relevant time for urban living. When we uh, think a little bit further, um, parking garages will change with more and more piloted cars. So the parking will, much, uh, will be much more dense. Um, you can leave some elevators and staircases out of the parking garages and um, you can pack more cars in the same um, infrastructure. Why aren't we here at the moment? Um, the question was yesterday a couple of times. Uh, because there are some situations we can imagine people use or misuse automated systems. So some, some of the funny pictures uh, from our hazard and risk analysis where maybe they do pilot surfing. Maybe this will be a cool children's game. How do we handle that? Um, well, what happens in the parking garage if uh, some parking lot is too small? It was assigned to the car, the car goes there and sees, oh, I don't fit. What if the battery of your smartphone is low and you can't call your car back? So you stand in front of the parking garage and you can't get any contact with your car. Has to be solved, is solved. Um, what is if there's some slippery uh, road in the parking garage and we lose our orientation? Things like that, more and more, a lot to do on the way of uh, pilot driving, uh, but we're pretty good in our way and we're pretty sure that we see these systems quite soon. One more thing is, till now we had direct uh, well, customer to OEM contact and that was it from the business side. With automated systems that talk to each other, that talk to the world, talk to parking garage, we'll see new services rising. So we see charging services, because if these cars park autonomously in the parking garage, they can interchange their parking lots and they can move to a charging lot um, within their parking time. And this will charge you money as well. And so there's further business to be run on these systems. Um, payment service for the parking, more cloud services, maybe parcel service to the car. And we have new players from the business side. So we have the parking garage owner, we have the garage operator, and we have suppliers that come into the business case and make it much, much better than before. The customer has just the easy view on the smartphone. So for the parking garage function, he said, okay, I'm here at the parking garage, send my car away, gets uh, the final information of vehicle has reached the target position. At the end, the driver can call the car back and gets the information that's ready for pickup. So, this sounds quite easy and leads for us to a clear vision. And that's this one. 
you please play the movie from the other? No thanks, we'll never change, like Grandpa used to say. Ten out of ten, nice! I love my job. I love driving. I love my Audi. I got my first one. Way back. Oh, no. First customer of the day. Uh-huh. 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 <clears throat> I was completely lost as a driver, but Audi had a Google Street View thing. He saved my ass so many times. On the screen, in reality, the same. <laughs> Second customer. Making that money. No. <clears throat> and I was always on time. Because of the traffic thing, you know, based on the, on the mobile data, you know what I mean. Everyone's got that now. But back in those days, I was the first. Some of my customers I still have to meet myself. These days, I can drive if I like. Oh, sir, good morning. Or to let drive if I'm feeling lazy. Everything started with LTE. I didn't even know the car had it or what it was for, but what it does. Amazing. Jason? Can you just walk for a second? Are we on time? Oh, yes. Traffic is perfect for us. Okay, thank you so much. If you need anything else, let me know. Defining mobility at CBS starting January 6th. Thanks a lot. 